Good morning, folks. We've got a day focused on space weather at the start and the end, some cosmology and seismology snuggled between them. Let's get started with our star at spaceweathernews.com, and we find the bright active regions at the limb and the dark coronal hole extensions coming up from the South Pole. The bright active regions have undergone slight decay. There are no solid sunspots beneath the skeleton of bright umbral magnetic fields and dancing plasma, but this is how solar cycles ramp up. Active region plagues and plasma filaments begin to get active before switching to another gear. This is what that other gear, the sun at sunspot maximum, looks like, by the way. And as you can see, even though the sun has clearly awoken from the sunspot minimum trough today, we have a ways to go to get here. Solar wind is up next, and while a coronal hole stream is on its way midweek, right now all is calm. This has kept the KP index low enough that a health alert had to go out through our app this morning, and real quickly for our new viewers, solar flaring is a magnitude-based risk, but geomagnetic conditions are one of equilibrium. Like food, not enough and you die, too much and you die. Right now, we are towards the left side, low end of the scale with about 36 hours of KP less than one. Couple quick notes on quakes. 5.5 off the coast of California is exactly where the December 2018 uptick finally stopped. I'm not exhaling for the west coast just yet, but that is noteworthy. Super weird quake up in northern Sweden, and not only is there a lack of faults in the region, what bad luck to have it hit exactly within the only little town around for miles and miles. Then again, it's a town called Kiruna, and they do a lot of out there science at the research facilities there, not to mention major digging. Speaking of quakes, Folks, I found this yesterday amidst clouded blots, 40-year-old material, and it has special relevance to the recent events at the White Island Volcano, where an eruption killed a number of people and injured others. Well, folks, the exact deep quake sequence at mid-magnitude were seen in the nine days leading up to the event. In fact, all rumbles above magnitude 4 in those nine days struck blot echo depths, and anyone who wants to go into the GeoNet data to check the smaller quakes, I'd be very interested to hear what you find. Of course, as you might have guessed, blot echoes are named after clouded blot, whose science has been re-engineered today to help predict large earthquakes, along with all the other factors published in the years since. All of them are put together at QuakeWatch.net, and it's a good time to mention that because we are in a bit of a drought at the magnitude 7 range, which is why the seismic topic has received less coverage on our show here of late. We do expect them about once every 20 days statistically, got one in January, February, and late March, but none since then, and we are officially overdue statistically. Up next is a quick note in the cosmology realm. The largest scale structures in the cosmos are beginning to be better understood at those largest scales, as the sanyayev zeldovich effect has been spotted from those structures for the first time. Whether it's image stacking or technological advancement, each continues to reveal more and more of what was hiding in plain sight, and it's a plasma universe. Now a fantastic piece up next, which takes plasma cosmology to the level of the sun and the earth, and which takes us back to Hannes Alfain. They say charge exchange between magnetopause and space weather is enough, and that the standard magnetic reconnection of lines of force is not needed. And I will go ahead and second that notion, since the way they describe reconnection isn't a bad qualitative description of what's going on, but which fails to ride on the essence of truth. It's not some magnetic force, it's the charged particles in the currents, explosively releasing the energy of the circuit at the point of disruption, where the charge exchange takes over. And I would like to remind everyone that space plasmas and the magnetic field of Earth do not satisfy the mean free path rule of the electron flow. The math they use takes shortcuts and oversimplifies to its detriment. Now just below the magnetic field, we find the ionosphere, and here they are taking a closer look at the joule heating of the upper ionosphere during severe geomagnetic storms. As expected, the stronger the geomagnetic storm, the stronger the joule heating and the longer it lasts, regardless of whether a CME or coronal hole stream caused it, and regardless of what solar irradiance is doing. Now this is critical, because that heating was years ago ignored, and then, in years recent, believed to be bled back out into space considering how high up it was occurring. But as we come back to one of the best papers from 2019 on this topic, and sort of pick this one at random, there's over a hundred you could pick from in the last decade, the entire atmospheric electrical nature is affected by the ionospheric intake. 
Folks, this is what has been missing from climate models. The electrical heating of the atmosphere and forcing of the water vapor via the interaction with the magnetic field and ionosphere. This is why they notice surface pressure changes with the solar wind variations in just minutes, because it's an electric circuit up and down through the atmosphere. Folks, we greatly appreciate your support. Website members at suspiciousobservers.org, we did a deeper look yesterday on those dusty magnetic pinballs and why they say the sun is a recurrent micronova star. And of course, your podcast from this past weekend is up and it was a doozy as well. We've got your wind map forecasts and shots of our star to close. And of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow, right here. But right now, it's 5 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.